year when the economic crisis was at its fullest. One of the talking points by the Colombo Liberals was Chinese loans, especially those professors who lectured at the Gulf Face Green to educate the misled innocent public. The go-to line was that Rajapaksa's attempt to take loans from China was why Sri Lanka was in this state. Soon after, they said that Sri Lanka must go to the IMF and get a loan to fix the economic problems created by loans. Do you see how they fool you? Now, China, on the other hand, um, in uh, other parts of the world, is retracting its support to various countries, mainly due to this rhetoric by the United States about their loans. As you can clearly see here in Sri Lanka, amidst the full-blown economic crisis, we really didn't see the same way of support we used to see from China financially. Suppose you look at the latest data, despite new uh, lending in 2022. In that case, the Chinese development finance institution's engagement with Latin American countries, sovereign and uh, state-owned enterprises is likely to remain relatively subdued in this year as well, especially on the part of uh, the China Development Bank. Now joining me now from Washington, D.C. via Zoom is the director of the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue, Margaret Myers. Thank you very much, Margaret, for your time. Appreciate it. First, let me ask you about the uh, retraction of loans provided by China to many nations worldwide. Now, is this because China also sees that their loans are not addressing the key issues of those countries? Basically, they accept that they are part of the so-called debt trap diplomacy America is accusing them of. Well, thank you, Mahesh, first of all, for the opportunity to be here, but also this, that's a wonderful, a really critical and, and very timely question. Um, yes, I mean, China's encountering all sorts of, of debt-related challenges globally. Um, this includes in Latin America and the Caribbean, where I've you know, focused for over a decade now, but also when you look at the numbers, this is not a specifically one region phenomenon, right? This is indeed global and is going to pose many challenges for China looking ahead as it looks to renegotiate some of the terms of this debt and just manage what is overall potentially a, a real crisis situation for some of these banks. My sense is that their calculus, the reason why we've seen a, a real decline, especially in policy bank lending, so that's China Development Bank, China Export Import Bank, the main banks that have been active in, in delivering the Belt and Road Initiative, is because, um, you know, there's a sense that uh, China's own interests at home, China's domestic uh, economic objectives are best served by focusing the attention of the policy banks more at home these days, and then having Chinese companies um, and, and in many cases, commercial banks, ICBC, Bank of China, carry out a lot of what the Belt and Road was initially intended to do, which was to help deliver Chinese technologies um, and you know, enhance connectivity in various forms across the globe. And indeed, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing right now uh, a drawdown in these major, you know, multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar deals to, to countries often backed in oil in certain cases. Um, those are those are a thing of the past. Instead, what we're seeing are smaller deals that are focused on sectors that China deems most critical to its its economic recovery. And so that's a very big part of why, you know, we're seeing this drawdown right now. Indeed, uh, make, makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, Margaret Sri Lanka is also part of a a recipient of many loans from China. So, in your opinion, why are we in this economic crisis? Did we fall for the debt trap diplomacy as well? It's, I mean, it much depends on how you define debt trap diplomacy, right? Are we talking about sort of irresponsible lending? Lending it to, you know, at a moment when a country is, you know, maybe not well equipped to take on more and higher levels of debt and will be essentially unable to repay that into the future. If that's the definition, then I think that applies to a lot of different countries, right? And including in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Venezuela is a, is a good example of that. China felt that it was mitigating risk by backing a lot of these loans in oil, and that didn't pay out once oil prices dropped, right? Uh, and now there's a, a real payment crisis there and in other places like Ecuador. Um, in the case of Sri Lanka, I mean, and in a lot of these cases, the, the challenge is, you know, both 
or I would say, you know, the implications are are both related to China's actions and the actions of the governments that have made these decisions. And this is not a Sri Lanka, you know, ex- exclusive ex- uh, circumstance, right? Um, there are decisions made by governments to take on these loans at moments when probably they should not have or they should not have at the terms that were agreed upon. And uh, and that's a big problem. Um, another issue that we see sort of across the board, and this has been well documented in recent literature, is a tendency for a lot of these deals to be made behind closed doors with a considerable degree of, of opacity. And that makes it much more difficult to, to monitor them, to ensure, you know, for all parties involved, to ensure that they are progressing um, in a responsible manner and are indeed, you know, feasible from an economic, from a financial perspective for the country. Uh, so really prevents the the sort of out input, you know, that one would need from from wide ranging stakeholders to make these outcomes overall positive. And that's that's the case, I believe, in Sri Lanka and a lot of other places. Margaret, I'm uh, curious to know, uh, how do you see the uh, Chinese economy forming in the next decade or so? Uh, is it true that China will overcome the United States or did COVID change that? China still, uh, you know, has many engines of growth. <laughs> um, that it can rely on and indeed is shifting somewhat its model of overseas engagement, as I mentioned before, focusing on certain sectors that will promote uh, development at home. Um, I, it's my belief that China will continue to grow at moderate rates, right, in, in the coming years, which was the ultimate goal was moderate rates of economic growth, right, as of the beginning of the Xi Jinping era and then even beforehand. Um, at, there are, of course, challenges. Right, that China is encountering, that it's facing right now, including as concerns the real estate market, which is very difficult to manage. Uh, and that has, you know, made China rely even more heavily on, on innovation, on productivity. And so much will depend on whether China is able to, to, you know, boost productivity by focusing more or less on innovation related sectors, both at home and overseas. And so I think in the global south, um, especially because a lot of these markets are blocked in the global north, we'll see an, an absolute surge, if not continue level of activity, right, in, in these sectors that China considers to be new infrastructure, right, which is largely um, innovation related uh, technologies and services. So that that strikes me as a, a major trend forthcoming uh, and China's success in, in making this happen will will dictate, you know, where things head in the next few years. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, Margaret Myers, Director of Asia and Latin America Program at the Inter-American Dialogue. Many thanks once again. Uh, so how are we as a nation to come out of this economic crisis we are in? What are the solutions out there? Joining me now is Professor at the Economic Department at the University of Colombo, Professor Lalita Siri Gunarwan. He joins me via Zoom. Professor, I spoke to you uh, about how we got into this situation uh, as a country on Getria uh, a couple of weeks back. I want to ask you what solutions we can proactively implement that would give us results and not do a bit of patchwork like we used to do for the past 75 years. Uh, my is now one thing we got to understand is that um, an illness cannot be cured by prescribing the same which caused the problem, which caused the illness. So number one is that we got to understand, as we discussed last time, what caused this illness. So the solution has to be the opposite of what has caused this problem. The first thing is that we should be able to deterministically deterministically, we need to uh, uh, control our expenditure in two dimensions. One is expenditure on imports and on the other hand is expenditure by the state sector. Now to that extent, state sector expenditure being uh, uh, made more efficient and more, and, and, and more kind of uh, 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 reducing wasteful expenditure, uh, uh, we can reduce the budget deficit. We can reduce the budget expenditure to that extent. I think the IMF's prescription in that way is rational, reasonable. But on the other hand, we go into controlling imports, which is, I would consider, the, the, the most important or most imminent cause for this uh, uh, problem of uh, foreign exchange. 
there i don't think just the budget deficit control or expenditure control by the government would solve the problem because the private sector also the non government sector also is responsible for a uh, uh, import intensive consumption so the measures have to be taken with the uh, immediate effect to control uh, uh, the the imports and uh, import substitutive industrialization and the industrialization to produce for the local uh, requirements and priority given for local uh, products in both local consumption and local investment have to be priority measures unfortunately those aspects have been not present significantly or at least sometimes it is not there at all in the ims prescription that's what is sad of it absolutely uh, professor how important is it that we include the geopolitical aspect and close down the loopholes that have provided uh, direct involvement by western powers in our internal affairs how vital is including that aspect in finding the answer to sri lanka where we control our narrative my the important point is our sovereignty so if sri lanka is to be a sovereign country in the future we should be very careful of the strategies the uh, the, the others play on sri lanka now one of the ways of surrendering not only a country but even a company or even a household is by letting them borrow and becoming indebted once a person is indebted once a once a society is indebted once a company is indebted once a country is indebted to maybe a geopolitical uh, uh, interested parties then our sovereignty will be badly at stake now here that is exactly what has happened to sri lanka now we are indebted to many 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 parties who are really uh, you know looking at with geopolitical interest in the in the region where the the indian ocean region is and sri lanka is now basically uh, on the knees in front of those uh, those players now if we really want to get out of this problem without losing our sovereignty we have to be very 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 careful because now what they would want us on the one hand is to go further borrowing from them maybe from western world or maybe from uh, other geopolitical geopolitically interested powers in the region like india or maybe china or maybe other countries and then as a as a, as an outcome of that or as a, as a remedy to that seeking control over our national assets and national enterprises and that is what is apparently being uh, 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 kind of uh, undertaken now in the guise of under the guise of uh, uh 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 restructuring where our strategic and national assets publicly owned assets are being gradually uh, uh, divested where the stake can be bought over by those people who are having a, a, a geopolitical stake in this region and after all what is going to happen if that continues in that way is that sri lanka will lose the controlling powers of our own strategic interest and own strat- strategic assets and our uh, public uh, property and finally we will have a country uh, uh, geog- geographically we will have a country but not run or not managed or not owned by our future generations that's very dangerous sri lankans will have to be very careful of this uh, possible dangerous outcome absolutely um thank you very much uh, that was the professor at the economics department at the university of colombo professor ladita siri gunarwal Let's take a short commercial break. This is the state of the nation back in a moment.